I don't think that moral cognition has evolved at all. Like, I don't think it's innate. I don't think people have an innate predisposition to be especially concerned about um, well-being and suffering. Uh, I think people can normalize so, pretty much anything. So, I mean, there's no, that. But and I so, don't think that will... So if, if an innocent, like, say, person was suffering right in front of you, you wouldn't feel anything? You wouldn't, like... Of course I would. It, so there's a difference between... I'm here with Lance Bush, who is a PhD, currently a PhD student in psychology from the University of Cornell. His areas of study are the psychology of myth ethics, moral realism, and anti-realism, and uh, methodological issues in experimental philosophy. He has published articles in these domains. This is uh, very important, and uh, the articles are pretty good, in my opinion. Uh, I like uh, Lance a lot for his work. He's very clear um, in his work, and not everybody is uh, is clear when they publish. And uh, I really like his reliance on empirical experiments when talking about uh, philosophy and morals. Uh, truly a gem, truly a gem in in many regards. So I'm very happy to be talking to him today. Um, he has a blog and a YouTube channel. Uh, his YouTube channel is at lanceindependent.com. Um, his blog, sorry, is at lanceindependent.com. And your YouTube channel is named Lance Independent too, correct? That's correct. Yep. And um, of his blog, I... Uh, I really liked uh, one of his uh, one of his titles that was named "Philosophy is often psychology with a sample size of one." That was very funny, and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so Lance is a moral anti-realist, while I'm currently a moral realist of a naturalist kind. So we're going to be chatting about this. Um, just to uh, just a heads up for the audience if you if you're ever uh, doubting uh, um, at some point who's correct uh, or who might or who's right uh, Lance is uh, uh, more of an expert than me in these fields because I have a PhD in statistics so you should probably side with him if you have any doubts um, uh, we're gonna have a nice chat so how are you I'm good. One thing I would say, though, is that I have I, I don't know if I would say I'm an expert in meta ethics per se. So my my dissertation research focused on the psychology of meta ethics. Um, the other thing I'd say is, well, I, I also thank you for all the positive things you've said about me. I don't put that yeah. much stock in formal training and expertise. Uh, ultimately, the you know, a person's Posi like whether a position is credible or not comes down to the quality of the arguments. And I've seen many people that have read or studied or trained in something outside of their formal areas of education that do extraordinarily well at articulating themselves. Uh, so yeah, that's, I, I wouldn't say people should side with me. Uh, the other thing I will add is that within uh, analytic philosophy and within people that specialize in meta ethics in particular, my position is, uh, the anti-realist position, is a minority position. So the last big survey on this was the Phil Papers 2020 survey, and it found that 62% of the philosophers that responded to that survey endorsed moral realism. A much smaller number uh, endorsed moral anti-realism. It wasn't the remainder. I think it was like 26%. And if you focus just on the ones that specialize in meta-ethics, that realist rate bumps up to about 65%. So the majority of people within the fields that we'll be discussing that specialize in these topics would endorse moral realism and not moral anti-realism. Yeah, actually, that's a nice note to to start because I think I'm actually in the majority position uh, with my uh, current moral uh, moral position since I'm a moral naturalist and that's uh, a realist position. So maybe I'll start by articulating um, what what I currently believe because I was previously an anti-realist, but I got moved to the naturalist position. So I believe that there are mind-independent moral facts that are intrinsically connected um, to our biology and um, universally. So universally in the sense that all humans uh, uh, 
Trevem. And um, yeah, so this position might seem strange at first glance since there's uh, a lot of difference between cultures in how they view morality. But the principles, I think the, the bedrock principles we share are perhaps more abstract than one might uh, immediately think. So, for example, I think that a bedrock principle we all share uh, is that um, my unnecessary suffering is bad. For example, I would say that that's something we all share uh, as humans. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to let you speak to see if you have some questions. Uh, I think you cut out there for a second, so I might have missed part of what you said. So uh, you said something about universalism, and I think I might not have caught what you said right before that. So you're a naturalist or okay. realist. You think that there are stance-independent moral facts. And can you say a bit a, a bit more about what those facts are and what, what their nature is? Yep. So uh, they're intrinsically connected to our biology, to the fact that we are human, and um we all, we all share them in, uh, by virtue that we are human. And uh, I would say that uh, they're more abstract than one might initially think uh, what I'm talking about. Of course, there's a lot of, cross -cult there's a lot of um, difference cross-culturally in how we talk and speak about morality and how we think about it. But I think there's some abstract, uh, higher-level concepts that, we, uh, um, that we're all shackled to believe in. And, uh, for example, one of them is... Uh, that my unnecessary suffering is bad. That's thing I think is a normative principle we all share as humans. For example. Okay, yeah. so um, so you've got this naturalist account. I think I think part of my my concern with what you're expressing is that um, it, a lot of it just I, I'm not sure how well specified it is. So there's can you give some more details of this? Like I'm not I'm not sure what I'm working with here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, I don't know. So I like to give this example. Uh, for example, I think that um, when we look at uh, uh, the logical sphere and we take uh, the law of non-contradiction, um, I think this law is in a similar way uh, tethered to, to us um, by virtue of the fact that we are humans, in the sense that we can't um, we can't escape it, and we obey it when we go around our lives, and uh, it's simply ingrained in our co in our con cognitive architecture, and we just uh, we're just stuck with it, let's say. And in the same way, I believe that uh, uh, some of our mm, bedrock. Uh, moral principles are ingrained in our cognitive architecture. And uh, we um, basically, uh, I, I'm a bit ambitious in what I believe, because I think they spell out the moral theory known as utilitarianism. So uh, how do we get utilitarianism? Uh, well, initially, we recognize that one of our shared uh, common uh, bedrock principles, moral principles, is that our unnecessary suffering is bad. And then I would say another one is that uh, the unnecessary suffering of innocent people is bad. And uh, then we recognize that if the suffering happens um, on Tuesday or Wednesday, it's mm, unimportant. And I would say... Um, so uh, basically here I'm kind of um, retelling the principles given by Sidwick in the Methods of Ethics, where he kind of uh, try, tries to distill down these, uh, uh, he tries to distill down the moral principles that build up utilitarianism. And I kind of think that uh, the moral principles he, he finds are, are true in virtue of our biology, of our cognitive architecture, et cetera. Uh, so when you say in virtue of our cognitive architecture, I, to what extent is what you're proposing subject to empirical inquiry with respect to like actually empirically studying whether this is a feature of our cognitive architecture, whether it's yeah. 
pan-cultural, like it, we would expect to find this in pretty much any human population anywhere in the world. Is that, and like, if, if this is framed in terms of empirical and in particular, something like a cognitive psychological hypothesis, I would be curious about the evidence supporting the hypothesis. Like what if it turns out we go out and we do empirical research on the sorts of things that people moralize or what, what kinds of moral principles people actually tend to endorse or whether they even endorse distinctively moral uh, principles at all. And we find that it's not the case that we get the kind of universal concern with the, the morally, uh, like having a moral principle that causing unnecessary suffering is wrong. Like what if we just don't find that, that that's the case? Yeah, I think that's a great question. If we find that that's not the case, then I would change my mind, of course. Uh, I believe that what I'm saying is in fact falsifiable and it's a benefit of this uh, of uh, of this kind of natural uh, uh, moral theory, naturalist moral theory I'm proposing. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen any studies that uh, try to ask these levels of abstract questions cross-culturally. So the kind of study I would like to see to kind of uh, initially start to test whether this is correct or not is try to actually give a questionnaire, a questionnaire to people uh, um outside uh, the weird cult the um, the western cultures but even you know to to all the different uh, cultures we can get our hands on and to see if uh, it's actually true that we all value we all intrinsically value uh we all intrinsically think that our unnecessary suffering is bad if we all believe that the unnecessary suffering of innocence is bad and uh, if we have a kind of universality principle given by Sidwick that uh, uh, the suffering, uh, if, if um, that, uh, I don't know, it, it, that it's a moral, that it would be a good act to uh, uh, jump in a fire to save two people, even if you die. Um, for example, that kind of resembles... Uh, uh, the universality benevolence principle of Sidwick. Yeah, I mean, you have to find a way, of course, of these questionnaires to um, kind of boil it down to things people can actually answer and actually interpret it correctly, uh, as you point out in, in your research. Uh, but I think, yeah, that there's a chance that um, my kind of naturalism is falsifiable and it may very well be false, but I haven't yet seen much evidence uh, to the contrary. Uh, I do have some preliminary evidence for my position uh, instead. Yeah, what kinds of um, evidence would you appeal to to support this account? Yeah, uh, so mm, probably the most canonical kind of evidence I would initially appeal to are the studies done by Gray on uh, dyadic completion. Uh, I'm sure you're very familiar with these studies, but maybe, mm, maybe for the audience, I'll just um, explain my understanding at least. Uh, my understanding is that the studies of Gray kind of are trying to build a, a body of work that um, tells us that even in cases where um, there's a moral conundrum where suffering doesn't seem present we have to um, we have to kind of um, always go back to um, suffering as a reason for the moral conundrum being immoral let's say we have a moral conundrum where something uh, uh, that, the, that the culture deems immoral happens uh, even if uh, there's no apparent suffering we have to perform this dyadic completion where we kind of um, invent uh, in some kind in some cases invent a subject that is suffering to uh, to deem it immoral um, I don't know perhaps you can explain it better than what I just did right now well you might be more familiar with these studies than than I am it's it, you know I'm not that familiar with the dyadic completion model. So I know that Gray uh, has done some work criticizing some of the other research that has preceded uh, that work, primarily moral foundations theory. So from my understanding of that, so moral foundations theory is this approach uh, 
to understanding morality that says that people, um, different populations will all tend to share a sort of underlying set of issues that they moralize that, and, and what tends to vary from one population to another is the degree to which they emphasize these different moral foundations. And that would be uh, harm, purity, fairness, uh, respect, and uh, what harm, fairness, purity, respect, and uh, loyalty. And uh, sometimes people propose another one, uh, liberty. And so what that research um, is, is predicated on is giving people these questionnaires. And this is, has been done cross-culturally, and they have found cross-cultural variation in this, is the degree to which people will emphasize these various uh, sorts of concerns. And some populations will emphasize certain sorts of things more than others. And one of the things that you'll tend to find is that certain populations, for instance, will tend to put relatively greater emphasis on harm and fairness. Now, uh, what I recall from Gray's work is that a lot of it is predicated on showing that in a lot of those cases, there is the sort of either an a priori assumption that the kind of issue that people are moralizing, like some purity issue, there is a presumption on the part of the researchers that the person wouldn't think the issue is a matter of, of being reducible to concerns about harm or well-being but uh, that that's, that's an a priori imposition. What I mean by that is I come up with a survey. I come up with what I consider as a researcher to be a harmless wrong. Um, I don't know what would be a good example of this. I don't know, having sex outside of marriage or, some, or masturbating or something like that, uh, where a person might, you know, as a researcher, I might think that there's nothing harmful about that. Uh, and if someone thought of that as wrong, they would think of it in terms of it be like violating like sexual purity or something like that. They wouldn't think of it in terms of there being a victim that's harmed because, it, I, you know, from my point of view, it doesn't seem like there is. So then I go and ask people that, you know, how much do you agree or disagree that sex outside of marriage is morally wrong or how much do you consider that to be a moral issue? And, you know, some populations are like not a moral issue or not morally wrong. Other populations say, yeah, that's a moral issue. Yeah, that's morally wrong. And then I conclude, look, so if populations vary in the degree to which they uh, moralize issues related to purity. I conceptualize in that way. Now, the, the other thing with that would be if I ask people that sort of question and I ask them a bunch of other questions, I could then, uh, you know, run factor analysis on the whole big cluster of responses that they give and see if there's a pattern in the overall uh, responses that people give that would comport with, you know, does a pattern emerge from that that would be consistent with there being these distinct uh, clusters in the in the way that people respond to these sorts of questions. And it might turn out that the what I would conceive of as a, the, like a priori as these uh, like purity violations, that the purity related questions that I'm looking at would uh, like sort of fit that category. It looks like it's a distinct cluster of things that people are moralizing that's not reducible to concerns about harm and fairness. Uh, I read one of Gray's papers a while ago uh, with a, with a couple other people. I think it is called. Uh, yeah, I had it. I was pulled it up here. The myth of harmless wrongs and moral cognition: automatic dyadic completion uh, from sin to suffering. So I read that a while ago. I don't remember the contents of it. And I know there's been a bunch of follow up research after that. I haven't looked into that research. So we're in an an amusing situation where the person <laughs> that studies moral psychology probably knows less about this particular moral psychological research than the other person. And that that goes exactly to my point that just because, you know, I, one person has a degree in something and the other does it doesn't mean that they know more. I don't I wouldn't say that I know these studies better than you. Um, no, no, no. What I can't, uh, I, I'm what sure. I can't say is Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, first of all, you gave a very good explanation of what these studies are about. Um, yeah, so uh, so exactly. My position is exactly that. For example, if you take moral foundation uh, theory, I think all the, the different categories they, they identify can be reduced down, can all be boiled down to harm. At the end, uh, my suspicion is that everything can be reduced down to harm. And the reason why we find the cross-cultural differences is because uh, every culture... Mm, so um, this is important. So uh, um, every culture has rules and norms. And these rules and norms, I believe, build up in a utilitarian fashion. 
So what happens is that the elders of a village, of, of a village, of the elders of a population get together, and they decide which norms uh, will increase the well-being of our group the most. And uh, once you establish these norms, uh, you get heuristics that get passed down in the population. And these norms are extremely important because, as we as we both know. Um, Following utilitarian, um, following utilitarian principles, following following the utilitarian principle, is very costly, and um, it, it can't. It, it simply can't be done. You need heuristics to, um, I mean, to be a utilitarian, uh, because if you're going to be stuck calculating the utility of every action every second, uh, you're not going to go anywhere. So you're going to need some some ways to proceed, uh, some some kind of guide, guiding rules to proceed during your life. And these guiding rules um, have to be, you have to find them somewhere. And uh, where we as humans find them is in our culture, in the norms that uh, uh, are born out of usually the elders, not, not always, not always uh, uh, they're born out of politics. Sometimes they, they can emerge uh, intrinsically in populations. And uh, uh, the motivating factor of these norms is to follow the utilitarian principles. So this is a long-winded explanation to say that the reason we see cross-cultural differences uh, in how we think about morality or we think this act is more pure in this society or in another society is because uh, these norms uh, rely on the context, on the environment in which, we're, in which, um, in which we find ourselves. So, so to give an example that is usually championed by moral relativists, but instead I find a, a striking example of a utilitarian principle bared out in a norm. Uh, let's take the population of the Eskimos. The Eskimos uh, in the 800s and uh, even for part of the, uh, 19th, of the 20th century had a norm, at least I believe if I'm recalling the dates correctly, had a norm where they would leave... Uh, uh, their child's, not all their child's, but let's say the child's they couldn't support, they would leave them to uh, die out in the cold uh, because, of course, they had a great scarcity of resources. So what happened to the Eskimos is that they developed this cultural norm uh, out of uh, these uh, fundamental utilitarian principles. And, uh, and this norm seems absolutely horrific to, to our eyes, to our Western societies, because we don't uh, we don't think it's morally acceptable to leave children that die out in the cold. But for them, of course, because we were in a different circumstance, in a different setting, different environment, uh, they saw this as uh, uh, not only acceptable, but even uh, moral or perhaps the right thing to do in some cases. So uh, I don't know if... Yeah, a couple things. So one yeah. of the first things I want to draw a distinction between is um, the notion that morality is fundamentally about harm and utilitarianism. So one concern I would have would be this. Um, let's say, uh, you know, to give a classic sort of example, there's a burning building and a person, they can, a person can only go in and they could go to the left or to the right. And if they go to the left, they save their own child from suffering a terrible death. And if they go to the right, they save the, the children of five strangers from suffering a terrible death. Uh, two things about this. One is that it would seem to me that without the caveats and qualifiers that a utilitarian might try to typically, uh, you know, think about in these sorts of situations, like maybe it's the, the best thing from a utilitarian point of view is for us to commit to prioritizing our family over strangers it up to a certain point, something like that. So there's ways that utilitarians might say you should favor your own child um, that would be consistent with utilitarianism, however plausible or implausible other people find them. But the sort of um, surface level utilitarian response is to save the, ch the children of five strangers. And yet I think most people uh, would favor uh, saving their own child over five strangers. And if, if it's, you know, if, if they would still favor five, we could cut it down to two or three. There's going to be some degree to which people prioritize the well-being and the reduction in suffering of some people over others. And not only would they do this in practice, not only would they say that they would do this in practice, they might also report that they think that it's morally permissible or even morally obligatory to do so. And that, I think, indicates, and if we go and look at findings that would support this, 
um, it would suggest that although even even if people and let's just you know bracket for a moment whether people moralize things other than harm and suffer uh, like harm and uh, like well-being and suffering we should say um if we bracket the concern that they they moralize other sorts of things there's still going to be a uh, moralized partiality in people's attitudes and preferences and i don't think the dyadic completion model suggests otherwise i don't think you know just saying that moral judgments are implicitly driven by an unconscious you know conception of there being a perpetrator and a victim and that what makes someone a victim is that is that in some sense their harm is being inflicted on them which i think is what the, the completion model proposes um doesn't mean that uh people are motivated by a desire to maximize utility because uh, someone that favors their own family members over others is not trying to maximize utility yep so that seems to be one problem yep so you're absolutely correct. So the, um, the added completion theory doesn't support the claims, uh, uh, my bold claims. So uh, it, it's just um, some piece of, uh, let's say, preliminary evidence. Um, so, so to answer uh, to answer your example, so how do I fit uh, how do I fit this kind of example in my framework? Uh, well, mm, the fact is that um, so not only we have uh, let's say a bias towards our own uh, our own sons our own daughters we we certainly have a bias towards our own suffering uh, i would say so we, we kind of uh, yeah we we don't manage to live up to the utilitarian principles uh, but i think this is exactly uh, a bias in a sense in the sense that uh, we recognize that some moral principles are uh, true, in a way, and uh, if we were to act completely morally and uh, coherently with respect to these principles, we um, we would, in fact, uh, perhaps save five children of uh, of our friends instead of our own instead of our own. But um, mm, we don't do this because uh, because. W we don't perfectly follow uh, our underlying moral principles uh, uh, as robots. In the same way, for instance, we don't follow we don't perfectly follow follow our inferential uh, bedrock principles that spell out the theory of statistics uh, as robots. Especially in a high stress situation, we wouldn't do that um, because, uh, yeah, we're biased. We have a, a lot of problems going on. We're limited beings that can't exactly uh, uh, you know be logical all the time be uh, be rational all the time or be moral all the time especially when we have these uh, emotions connected to our, our child or ourselves um, yeah so in, in a sense I agree with you we, we don't uh, I mean I'm not advocating for the fact that every person behaves, every moral person behaves like a perfect utilitarian because that would obviously be absurd. But uh, what I think happens is that a lot of people don't think about morality, like they don't think about uh, statistical inference or logic. So they act illogically or they act or they make very bad inferences, even if we do have some bedrock, uh, some bedrock principles in morality and in uh, uh, epistemology. Uh, according to me, of course, but this is another debatable factor, and um, and yeah, so uh, especially in high stress situations and situations where we're personally involved, we're not going to be uh, very good at uh, um, making moral making moral decisions. Where we are going to be better at making moral decisions is when we think and reflect uh, and reflect on these kind of conundrums uh, more. Uh, so um, when we activate type two thinking instead of type one thinking here, I am uh, referring to dual process to the dual process theory literature. And I think that uh, when we when we think more and when we reflect more, uh, we we kind of uh, realize that if we want to be in line with uh, with our bedrock moral principles, we we have to act uh, in a utilitarian way. 
So there's a few, I, I think there, there would be quite a few. And of course, you're not couching this as like, this is settled science. Um, but just to be clear, are you oh, claiming no. that ultimately the stance independent moral facts are exclusively reducible to concerns about well-being and suffering? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Okay. So, I mean, ha having not really delved into the dyadic completion uh, approach to things, which may construe them in that way, I should say, like, at, at a first pass, there's a, uh, there's a couple things to say. One is that there are a variety of other models of human moral cognition and moral judgment, the kinds of things people moralize. And while it, of course, you could, uh, you know, go and look at the gray literature um, with Gray and colleagues, uh, that may suggest that that's one possibility. I don't think anybody would say that the matter here is settled. So there would be ongoing disputes with people like, uh, you know, Jonathan Haidt and the people that would be encouraging a, a um, something like moral foundations theory. Then you have Oliver Scott Curry's work on the trying to you know, maintain that morality is fundamentally about cooperation. Uh, I know uh, Sterling and Fraser have a, a paper that that argues for a naturalist account of re uh, realism that I think likewise grounds it in the development of, of sort of uh, cooperative enterprises. And that wouldn't reduce the moral facts to, to being facts about well-being and suffering, but facts about what would uh, allow for and facilitate cooperation within groups. So there are a variety of other ways uh, of other ways of naturalizing the moral facts and saying, here's, here are the natural facts that the moral facts correspond to. And I don't think that the matter is settled on that. Uh, the other thing is just, you know, it, it might be a while before we really get into actually resolving that. And in the case of dyadic completion, I would have a few concerns about, like, uh, do you know if there's been substantial cross-cultural research showing that this provides a, 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 this these sort of findings replicate in people from different cultures? Because I don't, I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't remember the samples that Gray uses and where he gets his populations. I, I kind of doubt that there's been a lot of, I mean, at least to the level that I would like to see it. There hasn't been any uh, uh, major cross-cultural research into, into these themes. Um, I mean... Uh, even if I'm a moral naturalist, what I'm claiming is a very fringe position. I mean, it's my personal position just as a guy looking into the moral literature and just, uh, you know, taking a stab at what uh, might be going on. Um, so, yeah, regarding what happens, uh, regarding cooperation, I think actually the accounts uh, that talk about cooperation can be, uh, can, can sort of fit in with... Um, universal benevolence principle given by Sidwick or some kind of, I'm not saying these principles are exactly correct. I'm saying that cooperation kind of uh, uh, can probably be derived by the fact that we care about the suffering of other innocent people. We care about our own suffering. So cooperation seems like an implication that would come out of a framework where we care about the suffering of, our, of, of ourselves and other people. So we should cooperate to you know, increase our well-being. Uh, regarding the literature on moral foundation theory by Jonathan Haidt, it's uh, a very interesting literature. And I think like the findings, they, their findings are interesting and um, as far as I can see, correct. Uh, but I think what they're measuring is, uh, the, is a kind of difference in the norms uh, in the norms, in the different cross-cultural cross, cross norms that we have in different nations. So uh, there's going to be differences, of course, uh, by virtue of the fact that we, mm, every culture decides different heuristics to go, by, to go about, to abide by these, uh, by, you know, to maximize utility, in a sense. They all... Uh, they all invent different principles that they think are the best to, you know, to, to get the job done. And, uh, and this, of course, uh, kind of uh, uh, trickles down to folk, to folk morality, to how the people think about morality. And uh, yeah, so um, what usually happens, I would say, in populations is that the people... Uh, um, 
usually people in populations just think about morality uh, in uh, in in following the rules and the laws and the norms of uh, of a the society they're in. They they don't think they don't kind of try to think about their bedrock principles and uh, and start from there. They just adopt a set of heuristics that that the of the culture they're in, and then uh, just take it from there. So. We have all these moral disagreements, these moral differences that just come out of the fact that we're using different mm, different rules, different norms to to go about our day. I don't know if this actually answers uh, much of what I'm saying. I, I basically it's should say, I, I, yeah, you know, I just concede. I just concede. I, I'm willing to concede so much to you. Like, of course, like what I'm what I'm what I'm kind of proposing is. It's kind of just a, a fringe theory. Like we have to, there's such, there's so much uh, empirical evidence, empirical, yeah, research we we should do around these matters to to understand them better, for sure. Yeah, one th one thing I would wonder mm -hmm. is if you've looked much into the dual process model of moral cognition that uh, Josh Green puts forward, and whether or not that could, in some ways, um, you know, support the kind of account you're putting forward and in some ways detract from it. So I, I guess I could say a little bit about that. Uh, so Green has characterized the early work on this as trolleyology. And so many people that are listening or watching this, uh, are listening to this or watching this are going to be familiar with that. But I'll go over it just for the people that haven't. Uh, OK, so with the way that that research uh, proceeds is that uh, participants will be asked to consider one of two cases. The first case is the switch case. And so a train is headed down the tracks and it's headed towards five people. And if nothing, if nobody stops it, it will kill the five people on the tracks. You are standing there and you have two and only two options. There's no other people. There's nothing else you could do. You only have these two options. You could pull the switch or not pull the switch. If you don't pull the switch, it will continue on and kill the five people. If you do pull the switch, it will divert the train onto a side track will hit one person instead. And then so the question is, is this morally permissible or not? And you could ask a variety of questions about it. Do you think you should do it? Do you think you would do it? There's a bunch of questions you could ask. And when you ask people this question, in many populations, though I don't know necessarily if it's all, I do know that there's been some attempts to research this in different populations. Uh, people don't always give the same pattern of responses. I also think it started to change over time how people respond to these sorts of questions. So in general, Typically, most people, it might be 80, 90 percent or so, will tend to say it's it, you should or you <clears throat> it would be permissible to pull the switch, uh, like morally speaking. The other case has a, <clears throat> a person whose body is large enough to stop the train and you're standing on a train track and you uh, sorry, you're standing on a bridge over the, the train track. It's headed towards the five people. There's no side track this time, but you could shove the person off the track and you know, they'll fall to their death and then their, the corpse will stop the train. It's kind of morbid, but that's how the scenario is set up. Um, so this is a, a classic scenario. Uh, is it Philippa Foote that came up with these scenarios? I think so. Uh, anyway, uh, so these are like classical, it, philosophers like to come up with uh, thought experiments that often have grim or absurd elements to them, um, maybe to make make what they're doing more interesting. I don't know. You know, you yeah, could have a bit of fun, I guess. Yeah, I, it's, it's grim fun, but yeah. So anyway, uh, most people think that you should not or that you would not or they think it's morally bad to shove the person off the bridge, even though one could argue you get the same result. One person dies or is killed. Uh, and that's it's debatable because some people would say there's a difference between killing a person as a means to an end and killing a person as a side effect. Or there's a difference between letting someone die or allowing it to be the case that someone dies and actively killing someone. So someone could argue that there's a principal moral difference. That's can, anyway, the point is... Can you just yeah. repeat? Can you just you, you just cut out for like five seconds. Just repeat the last no things problem. you were saying. Uh, sorry. Sure. Okay, so um, I don't even remember exactly what I was saying. Uh, but <laughs> so you have these... these um, two possible outcomes, which, uh, sorry, uh, you, you have a variety of different uh, possible response patterns. You could say in the switch case, you should pull the switch and you should push in the footbridge case. You could say you shouldn't do it in either, or you could say you should pull on the switch, but not in the footbridge, or you should not pull in the switch and push in the footbridge. I've never heard of anybody doing that. I'm sure you occasionally get a person that does that. Anyway, so your options here um, seem to give these, these two standard patterns of response that reliably emerge in that research. One is for people to say it's okay to pull 
the switch in the switch case, but it's not okay to push the person off the bridge. The other standard pattern is to say it's okay to do both. And that first pattern, um, it would seem to suggest that the unwillingness to push would exhibit something that's been understood to re reflect a deontological normative moral stance towards the issue. Roughly speaking, that you act in accordance with uh, moral duties or rules, or you respect other people's rights, that sort of thing, rather than being exclusively concerned with the consequences. Whereas a person that's willing to push in the footbridge case uh, is exhibiting a consequentialist attitude because their concern mm. in both cases is to nope. minimize suffering me? and maximize the amount of lives saved. Most of that research would seem to suggest that the majority of people don't exhibit what you could say is the characteristic utilitarian or, or consequentialist response pattern. Now, I have methodological concerns about whether or not that particular way of measuring people's responses is actually indicative of whether or not they are exhibiting a utilitarian or non-utilitarian response pattern. The primary reason for that, I mean, there's some people have questioned the neuroscientific research. I know there's other research that's argued that it's philosophically irrelevant, but the main concern I have is that the characteristics that are associated with people that are willing to push in the footbridge scenario, uh, when you measure their responses to other sorts of questions, like uh, their support for egoism or their, their charitable behavior and that sort of thing, there's no real indication that people that are willing to push in the footbridge scenario or think that it's morally okay to do so exhibit other indicators of a commitment to utilitarianism. And some of the research has shown that they tend to score higher on subclinical measures of psychopathy. And in general, it may just be that the typical person that is willing to push in the footbridge scenario is someone that has lower empathy and uh, are, are they're less sensitive to the negative affective reaction one would have to the thought of pushing a person mm -hmm. uh, to, the, to their death. And so in that case, I'm not really sure that those studies are picking up on whether people are utilitarians or deontologists. But a general point I want to make about this moral psychological research, uh, because I have methodological concerns in that study, is that both on considering the kinds of things people moralize and the way that people, uh, like what the empirical literature overall seems to suggest, it seems to suggest people moralize all sorts of things that to me, I really question whether they're all reducible to well-being and suffering. And if Gray's evidence suggests that, that they are, that's interesting and that's worth looking at. Uh, but what, you know, a, a couple things I'd point out it is, well, first to, is that as, as we've already discussed, I'm, there's a difference between showing morality is reducible to concerns about harm and well-being and showing that it's, it's reducible to concerns about maximizing them impartially, which is what you would need to have to show that people are utilitarians. And I don't think that the empirical evidence supports that. Uh, Green's work seems to suggest that people have two general modes that they could operate in when making moral judgments. And one of them seems to function in this way, and one of them doesn't. Now, that would suggest that a big part of what people, uh, the way that human cognition is set up is to exhibit non-utilitarian, non-consequentialist, more deontologically sensitive moral judgments. That, I think, might create problems for any account that tries to naturalize the moral facts exclusively to the utilitarian facts. On the other hand, uh, Green himself uh, argues that we have reason to favor uh, overall the outputs of the more consequentialist or utilitarian system because it's less sensitive to the sorts of biases or sort of, you could say, normatively or philosophically irrelevant factors that influence the output of the deontological system. And so that system, you could think of it more as this sort of fast and efficient way for us to produce generally like good judgments. But that the consequentialist one is the one that on reflection delivers the kinds of outputs that we would endorse. And so I could see someone appealing to that to argue that, um, you know, moral naturalism is the correct account in metaethics and uh, that we have reason, we could sort of um, selectively debunk the outputs of the deontological outputs of uh, moral judgments, but not the utilitarian ones. And so there you go. You have your sort of utilitarian <laughs> outputs. You could you could make an argument like that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's along the lines of what I do, uh, of, what, of what I try to do, at least, um, when, when I'm thinking by myself in my little room at night. Uh, no, but um, so... 
what I think what I think is going on when people respond more deontologically is I think we have kind of um, we have different ways to uh, to um, we have different cognitive we have different cognitive ar cognitive architectures uh, that uh, are dealing with morality. I think we have we have kind of uh, um, I mean there's there's research there's research on this too. The fact that we uh, we like to adopt norms and the rules that people around us are adopting. So we uh, intrinsically internalize uh, laws and rules that come from society as if they're moral. And uh, uh, I believe, uh, I mean, of course, this is a very useful thing to do, uh, and uh, uh, it, it has to be done, even if we do have utilitarian uh, uh, bedrock principles, we need heuristics to govern our life. But we tend to confuse the heuristics with the underlying principles in a lot of cases. So a way to debunk the deontological answers, uh, in my view, is to say, uh, yeah, the, what's happening in this case is that there's a confusion going on. You are confusing the heuristics that you use to maximize utility with morality itself. And so uh, that's a way that I would selectively go about um, debunking the other kind of answers. Um, yeah, uh, perhaps there was something else I wanted to say, but it doesn't come to mind uh, right now. Um, what do you think about uh, what, what I just said? Yeah, and so I'm outlining the same general sketch that you could, in principle, yeah. try to employ. But the the question would be to get into the details of how successful you would be in showing that you can selectively debunk. In other words, show, okay, so um, moral judgments, we have all these different moral judgments. Some of them um, are utilitarian type judgments, and some of them are not. And what you would have to do, I think, to make a, a compelling case for this is to show that there is some principled reason to think that there are some underlying shared features of the non-utilitarian judgments um, are subject to certain sorts of doubt. Like we can criticize them, we can debunk them in a certain sense. We can show that there's a reason to reject those outputs, but to not reject the outputs of the utilitarian system. That's why I call it selective debunking. Um, I, think, I think I think I think you have to do something like that. But I, yeah. you know, like we would have to get into a big discussion in order to see if you could convincingly do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, but I, I like I think that in the research of Jonathan Hyde himself, you can see, uh, you can see, for example, when he talks about moral dumbfounding. Uh, oh, perhaps this is Greeny. Maybe I'm confusing, but uh, no, I, I think high. that's high. Okay, so so I think when when you see that some people exhibit this phenomena of moral dumbfounding, they exhibit it in cases when they can't rely on the utilitarian principles. That is when they're just following some heuristic. For example, they exhibit moral dumbfounding in the case of incest, of incest with um, with a family member where it's done only once and uh, you know there's no negative consequences, et cetera. And so th when they ask to justify why they think this is bad, they kind of reach they, they kind of reach you know nothing. They, they can't really explain why it's bad. They just know that they have an intuitive feeling it's bad. And I think what's happening, for example, in this case is that they have, uh, let's say, a more deontological, a more uh, rule-based heuristic that is passed down to society because in the majority of cases, it is in fact bad to have sex with family members because there's different power dynamics going on in the family. So this is a good rule to have in general. But when you apply it to a specific case where you're given all the assumptions uh, for which you know that there's not going to be any ulterior suffering after you do the deed, in this case, uh, you would still, it, still people can't justify it. And I think this is an example, of, for instance, of how you can start debunking the more deontological answers in a sense that they're applying these heuristics that's getting ingrained in them uh, from society, they get passed down. And uh, yeah, I, I would also say that... Uh, I see I see a striking similarity uh, to the inferential uh, domain when I look at the moral domain. So in the inferential domain, we have basically boiled down the principles of statistic to a bunch of axioms. 
to a bunch of axioms that I would say correspond to how we as human think about inference. I think we have cognitive architectures that are uh, that regard pattern recognition, and uh, they can be boiled down to basically a bunch a bunch of principles. At least this is what. Uh, the axiom of a field or probability and statistics, I think, imply in a sense. And uh, we see that humans can't always manage to um, act in accordance with these principles. Uh, even myself, who are, who am a researcher in statistics, and I know very well, for example, that two independent events you have to multiply you have to multiply their probabilities to get the probability of uh, two independent events occurring. It, uh, it's not so easy then to apply this in the real life at all times. So I, I make incorrect uh, um, inferences uh, or I kind of, uh, you know, on an impulse, I'll go betting on horses. Uh, so even, even if I know, um, even if I exactly know how the correct inference is done, it's not then that easy as a human to go out and, and perform it. So, uh, I would expect a lot of mistakes, even when we when we go and mm, you know uh, when we go and subject people to questionnaires regarding morality. I would I would expect them to answer, uh, let's say, incorrectly to many questions. But I think uh, Greeny, uh, the dual process theory of Greeny shows that the more you think about an answer, at least the more utilitarian the the uh, you, the more you think about a moral conundrum the more utilitarian the answer tends to be. So uh, that I would say that another, that's another little preliminary evidence uh, that supports my account. Okay, so here would be one concern I would have with the, the kind of claim that you're making here. Uh, if we look at the Phil Paper survey, uh, what we find is that a majority of the philosophers that have been surveyed do not endorse utilitarianism. Only about one third endorse consequentialism, and of those, I would suspect that uh, so, you know some smaller proportion are going to endorse some particular type of utilitarianism. Like if we're talking like classical hedonic utilitarianism, we're not talking about some other type of you know if we're not talking about preference utilitarianism or negative utilitarianism or satis you know satisfying utilitarianism. If we're talking about some specific type of utilitarianism, it's only going to be some smaller subset that endorse that. And so that would seem to suggest that at least within the field of people that spend a lot of time thinking about these sorts of issues, most of them don't endorse utilitarianism. And if if part of our concern is that demographic factors might be playing a role here, let me put the puppy down. <laughs> uh, no, puppy, it, puppy's yeah. audience. <laughs> we we want audience. the puppy. We want the puppy back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may bring her back up so she can okay. she can see what we're up to. Anyway, so if we're also concerned about demographic issues, then we're also um, you know going to have this uh, you know an additional concern, which is that philosophers in particular may be from populations that are especially likely, or at least shared with the people that are in a lot of of uh, you know the studies suggesting like the dyadic completion model, uh, and that would seem to support. Uh, well, that would seem to suggest that a lot of this research may be culturally parochial and that um, its philosophers of all people are disproportionately likely of any particular population to be more uh, concerned with harm and fairness relative to other potential populations. And they still, on reflection, reject utilitarianism. It seems to be rejected by the majority of philosophers. If anything, it's, it's you know, it's a it's standardly a punching bag in introductory ethics courses where they talk about how implausible and ridiculous it is. Now, I think a lot of those objections are cheap shots. They're not very good objections. Um, but nevertheless, it looks like, at least within the field of people that study the topic, on reflection, most of them don't endorse utilitarianism. They don't even endorse consequentialism. A lot of them find virtue ethics to be uh, more appealing, and a lot of them favor some type of deontological, or they might favor some type of hybrid account that combines elements yeah. of consequentialism and, and other sorts of accounts. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's rather puzzling that the people that spend the most time thinking about this, not to say that this is decisive. I don't think majorities in philosophy are especially strong evidence for or against anything. Uh, that seems like a puzzling thing that I would want an explanation from a naturalist utilitarian uh, to explain yeah. what, why is that? What's going on there? Yeah, I so this is a great point you bring up. And um, 
I would agree with you. It's uh, some evidence against my position for sure. Uh, so, I mean, there's some defenses I can give. Uh, so, one kind of defense is that um, now the, the modern versions of deontology, virtue ethics, and, and utilitarianism, I would say, have exhibited a kind of moral convergence. I think uh, these are the words of. Um, of Parfit, correct? I don't know if I, I think this is something that Parfit. Yeah, Par Parfit tried to to sort of synthesize and argue that we're we're sort of um, climbing the same mountain from different sides. Yeah. So what, well, at least what I've seen, uh, I mean, the few things that I've seen uh, when I look at the initial um, deontological frameworks and the initial virtue ethic frameworks, and now and consequentialism, it seems like they are tr they are kind of all converging to trying to get the same answers in a way or another. So we, we see versions of deontology that have utilitarian uh, mm, type principles baked into them. So they'll kind of say, okay, there's exceptions to when you can follow a rule, when there is some kind of disaster, you you're not, you, you can even not follow the deontological rule because we have a rule that uh, there's an exception to following the rule if there's some kind of uh, big uh, cataclysm appearing. And these I mean, seem inspired by utilitarian principles or by looking at consequentialist theories to ameliorate your own theory, in a sense. And so um, when I look at these... When I look at the moral theories, they do seem to be converging a bit to me. So uh, I don't know. I, I don't really know actually how this is. Uh, this is kind of a defense in the sense that, okay, the reason why people are incorrect, let's say, is because the moral theories are, be are becoming so similar to one another that it's... Uh, easier to just pick one and then it has utilitarian principles inside it and so it's basically a mix between the ontology and utilitarianism and another thing uh, another thing i wanted to say uh i had another thing i wanted to say but i, I can't quite recall right now uh, yeah. uh. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it just came back to me. Um, so, I mean, uh, from how I've laid out how I think morality works, uh, I would expect people to uh, very much enjoy the ontology or virtue ethics because they give more. Um, they give a set. Uh, often, they give a set of more practical heuristics, more practical rules one can apply in their everyday life. So. Uh, in a sense, I think it might be even uh, a discussion of what's more important. Are the heuristics more important of how I have to live my life? And in a sense, they are they are extremely important because you can't live your life going about applying the utilitarian, the utilitarian principles every day. So in an applied setting, they may be more important than the fundamental principles of morality themselves. And so... Uh, mm, I would expect, uh, you know, people to be confused around these matters, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, philosophers are not always right. And they were all theists 100 to 2,000 years ago. So perhaps. But I ultimately, ultimately, I acknowledge that um, you have a point. You definitely have a point when you, when you bring out um, what professional philosophers advocate for. Yeah, you know, I think we've been focusing so much on the empirical aspects of this and, and sort of uh, issues related to the, the substance of the normative elements of the meta-ethical position that we have, you know, been talking about this for a while, and we haven't even really addressed some of the more abstract meta-ethical considerations. So if we pivot over to that, I, th I think that that might be a fruitful avenue to explore as well. So... I guess one of my concerns is with, with these sorts of accounts, I'm still unclear on what the account is purporting to show. So, you know, I typically think of moral naturalist accounts to be attempting to demonstrate that there is a certain substantive and important type of fact, a moral fact, 
that these facts are stance independently true, meaning that they are true independent of our goals, standards, preferences, values, stances, you could say, uh, meaning that they're not made true by our stances. So, it, you know, in the case of like food, if I like chocolate ice cream more than vanilla, the fact that I like it makes it the case that it's better to me, like better according to my preferences. If we're understanding better in that subjective sense in the case of food, we don't have to, but we could. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, in that, it, it, with respect to food claims, then you can get this kind of subjectivism about food. And that wouldn't be the type of realism that the naturalist is concerned with because it's, it's relativizing the gastronomic claims to the individual. And the same thing would apply to uh, the naturalism about moral facts, that if moral facts are facts about people's preferences or attitudes, that's not the kind of moral facts that a naturalist necessarily cares about, even if they could, on a relativist account, be understood as moral facts. And this is, you know, one thing I would, I want, I, I should clarify about anti-realist positions. Anti-realists um, don't necessarily deny that there are moral facts. They just deny that there are stance independent moral facts. If you're a, a subjectivist, She's got a lot of energy. Um, if you're a subjectivist, you you would say something like this. Moral facts express uh, claims about what's morally good or bad that are that should be evaluated as true or false relative to the standards of the person making the claim. So when I say murder is wrong, you could sort of translate that into a sentence like murder is inconsistent with my moral standards. And then if murder is inconsistent with my moral standards, it would be true. And if it's not, it would be false. It could be lying, for instance. And that allows the, the truth status of moral fun, uh, moral claims to vary uh, in a way that's indexed to which standard they're being made relative to. So if some one person thinks murder is wrong, one person thinks it's not wrong. Uh, if the first person says murder is wrong, it's true. If the second person says murder is wrong, it's false. Because in the first case, the person is saying murder is inconsistent with my moral standards. It's true. And in the second case, they're saying murder is inconsistent with my moral standards. They actually don't think uh, that it's, it, it isn't inconsistent with the standards, so it'd be false. So... There's no contradiction in this. It's just that it allows truth statements uh, to vary. And I take it naturalists, that's not what they're after. They're after these stance-independent moral facts. Uh, but I'm still wondering what these facts are. Uh, one, of the, one of the biggest problems I, I take there to be with naturalist accounts is that the kinds of facts that they end up identifying strike me as descriptive facts. They are not, in a certain sense, prescriptive or irreducibly normative. They're just facts uh, from my point of view, about how particular linguistic communities use some some set of terminology. And what I mean by that is that the facts seem to amount to when someone says something like murder is wrong, it, on a naturalist account, uh, like let's take your account where this is in some way reducible to concerns about well-being and suffering, um, that might be understood as murder tends to reduce well-being or murder tends to cause suffering or unnecessary suffering perhaps. Or it tends to be inconsistent with acting so as to um, impartially maximize aggregate utility. Like we could get really specific if we want to. And, uh, you know, someone could say, okay, I agree that murder does not tend to increase well-being and it does tend to cause suffering. Okay, that's true. Now what? So, and th this is the problem that's often raised, this normativity objection to naturalism, which is that in a certain sense, it seems to be trivializing the realist account or or almost changing the subject in a certain sense. Of course, no one ever had to agree that the subject is what some other people think that it is. So the naturalist could say, I'm not changing the subject. I'm, I'm doing exactly what I set out to do. So I don't like when people say you're changing the subject. It's like, well, did we agree on the subject? Uh, so, But the concern here would be this. When I approach questions in morality, I would have thought the question is, well, what should I do? What, like I'm trying to make a decision, what considerations are relevant to me making that decision? And I take it that non-naturalists, realists are trying to offer accounts of what I ought to do independent of my goal, standards, or values. They're saying that, they're, they're saying that there are these facts that have some type of authoritative force or practical clout. They have oomph. There's various terminology Joyce and other people have proposed where I am in certain, some sense compelled, morally compelled, rationally compelled, or in some sense or, or maybe intrinsically motivated, um, or on recognizing the facts, there's some there's some reason I have to comply with them. So there's various accounts that non-naturalists could give about the implications of these facts and my belief in those facts. But 
the naturalist accounts just seem to be giving me something like murder tends to reduce well-being. Now, that matters to me, but that's because I value uh, well-being and I, I don't like suffering. I want there to be less suffering. So I care, but I don't care because I think it's a moral fact. I care because I don't like suffering and I like well-being. So if someone does not care, uh, it doesn't seem like this provides any action guiding. It doesn't have any authoritative force. It doesn't have any action guidingness to it. it you're just giving them a descriptive fact. And now, okay, well, these descriptive facts, if they don't, it, it, it doesn't seem to have any sort of um, reason giving force. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any ability. It doesn't have any authority. So someone could just say, and Joyce gives this example. He's, a, he's an error theorist. Um, you could have this rationally consistent Caligula. So you can imagine this person that has no moral scruples and they've they've rationally reflected on and considered all the implications of their actions and they're genuinely motivated by a desire to exploit other people and harm them. And they've correctly judged that they will have no regrets and will enjoy it all day long. And then you come to them and you say, yeah, but that's inconsistent with the, the moral facts. They could say, so what? And it, I don't see what any facts they're getting wrong. They're not making any mistakes if they go out and they torture and kill people. And so then you have this naturalist account, but it, it's not doing any, it's not doing any work other than, as far as I could tell, describing certain like judgment patterns or linguistic practices of particular groups. And then you're engaged in what looks to me like linguistics or cognitive psychology or or anthropology or something. And that might all be interesting, but it doesn't have the action guiding characteristics that I would have thought morality was supposed to be about. Uh, yeah. You're you're very clear, and um, I think I halfway agree with what you're saying. I think uh, it's um, it's a very important uh, objection. So, um, so I think that there's a couple of things to say. So, one of the things I would initially uh, start by saying is that because these uh, these moral facts, I think, are part of our biology. There's people who can be missing these moral facts, so they can be sociopaths. Sociopaths. So basically, uh, they do not they do not possess um, they do not possess uh, the ability to get in contact with these moral facts. Uh, they simply uh, do not have them, and uh, there's not going to be anything that I can say to them because. Uh, um, that, that will convince them otherwise if uh, if they're missing uh, you know some part of the brain or whatever the case maybe out maybe that doesn't allow them to understand these moral facts uh, much in the same way for example a crazy person might not understand you if you try to speak about some other deductive logical facts you um, that we all share you you won't be able to get through to her and uh, this is um uh, yeah, this is something that I. Uh, this is the way I construct uh, the naturalist framework. Now, uh, now your objection is correct in the sense that you, you say, okay, so, so, so these these are just descriptive fact. Where is the oomph? Um, where is the categorical normativity uh, around these facts? And. Um, yeah, they don't have it. I don't believe that something like that exists in the non-naturalist uh, sense. So when non-naturalists try to say that there's these um, oughts uh, or reasons uh, um, that are independent of my desire goals or something like that, I don't, uh, I don't understand exactly what they're talking about. I guess, uh, I guess you've convinced me on this point, having. Uh, uh, haven't uh, seen you talk about this uh, quite a bit. Uh, so the oomph and uh, the reason why these facts, I think, are still weighty in a sense, they still retain some weightiness, is because um, so people, uh, if you're a sane human being, these facts are going to be inside you. So they, they exist inside you. And uh, you're going to, a part of you is going to know when you're acting immorally. So you're going to experience some level of cognitive dif of cognitive dissonance. You're going to experience some level of suffering when you don't act in accordance to the, to the moral facts. And uh, uh, additionally, additionally, other people possess these moral facts. So other people can very quickly realize uh, if there's something off about how you're acting, if you're acting, let's say, immorally. So the weightiness of the moral facts is 
uh, a much more practical weightiness. The oomph uh, that the moral facts have is still, uh, uh, in my view, um, quite strong. So in a sense, I think we all care about our own happiness. And if you're... Uh, if you don't care about the moral facts, there's going to be real practical repercussions in your life, both from a personal standpoint and from the standpoint of society, uh, because these moral facts are shared, so we recognize them. And uh, uh, it's going to be hard for you also to escape. Mm. Another thing to say is that it's going to be hard for you to escape th their strength. Uh, uh, much in the same way, for example, that if you want to... Um, uh, for example, deny, yeah, let's say, let's take the law of non-contradiction that I would say is another biological uh, instantiated bedrock premise of uh, our cognition. Uh, you're going to have a very hard time trying to say, okay, I'm going to act as if this principle doesn't exist. And you, you might be able to, uh, you know, fool yourself for a couple of hours, but you're going to quickly uh, feel the presence of these moral facts inside you and you're not going to be able to uh, really re resist their strength for long uh, in a way what so what is it that people are supposed to be feeling feeling inside of them so i don't think i have these feelings at all well it, like what it, so what's it, the phenomenology it, like yeah, yeah. It, so if I'm not mistaken, you're quite warm to the consequentialist position, the utilitarian position, am I? Sure. But I don't. Th so like one thing I could tell you is that um, I, I mean, there's quite a few things, but one of them is that uh, I don't think that moral cognition is evolved at all. Like, I don't think it's innate. I don't think people have an innate predisposition to be especially concerned about um, well-being and suffering. Uh, I think people can normalize so, pretty much anything. Uh, so, I mean, there's no, that, but, and I so, don't think that'll... So if, if an innocent, like, say, person was suffering right in front of you, you wouldn't feel anything? You wouldn't, like... Of course I would. It, so there's a difference between, like, I don't like, like, a concern that you might have for certain sorts of things, having preferences for how you want things to be and what, what not to be, and moralizing those things. So part of my concern with a lot of these characterizations of moral realism is that I don't think that there's any principal distinction between moral considerations and non-moral considerations. I don't know what it means to say this thing is a moral thing rather than a non-moral thing. Uh, now, a naturalist can give some sort of um, analytic definition and say to say that this is a moral just is to say that it reduces well-being. But I, I don't know why I should buy that as a correct analysis of how people, like, is this supposed to be an analysis of how people use the language? Because if that's the case, let's go do the empirical work and I'll bet them anything they like. It's not going to turn out that that the way that people use moral language is is reducible to descriptions of what increases or decreases well-being. I'll bet anything they like. That's not how people use the language. Um, also, then there's a question of, of translation across cultures. Uh, are there moral cognate terms in all languages? Uh, I don't think that there are. And I don't think that all cultures have the same... Uh, like linguistic structure or the same conceptual structure as we do in weird populations. And I think that the empirical evidence is increasingly suggesting that this is the case. So you could look at the geography of morals project and, and work on how people from non weird cultures tend to conceptualize normative considerations. Now there has to be a very big caveat here. Now, part of the issue when saying this sort of thing is that people are so disposed many people to think in distinctively moral terms that they think that you're, if you're, you're saying this particular population, and we could give a hypothetical population, an alien extraterrestrial population, they don't have moral concepts. Uh, people seem to think that you're saying they don't care about lying and stealing and killing. That is a hundred percent not what is being said because someone could say we have uh, Zorpian concerns. We have, I, I think that it's, anti-Zorpian to murder. I think it's anti-Zorpian to lie. I think it's, it's very Zorpian to be kind and compassionate to others. And if you ask them what that means, they could say that Zorpian concerns are sui generis or primitive, and they can't be described in other terms. So the point there would be that you don't need, if you're going to say that certain sorts of concepts are distinctively moral versus non-moral, I would want to hear a convincing principled account of what it is that makes something moral versus non-moral. I don't think that there is one. 
And I don't think that there's any sort of successful analysis that distinguishes moral from non-moral consideration. So I see that like moral language as it's sui generis for a particular reason, which is that I don't think, uh, I think it's distinctive to particular populations. I think it's a culturally acquired set of terms and concepts. I don't think that people have an innate capacity for distinctively moral cognition. I do think it's plausible that people are disposed to think in normative terms, but I don't know what it means in particular for something to be moral. Um, so there's going to be all these sort of conceptual issues when we talk about uh, moral realism as opposed to some type of normative realism that's associated with particular types of, say, social concerns or concerns related to, to harm and well-being. That's one factor. Yep. Um, on top of that, I have other sorts of concerns when when talking about moral facts. So even if we just say we're going to operationalize uh, moral facts as facts about perhaps, harm and well-being. Sorry. Perhaps I should just answer to uh, I should just attempt to answer to this because it's it's going to sure. take a while. Okay. Um, so um, yeah, I'm familiar. I'm familiar that in the literature, uh, Turiel or Turiel. I don't know exactly how his name is pronounced, but he tried to give an account of what moral, uh, of what we mean by when we use the, with the word moral. And um, yeah, I've seen some studies uh, that, uh, uh, that show, as you rightly say, that uh, perhaps the word morality is not uh, cross-culturally shared, is not uh, a universal. Um, so in that case, if that turned out to be true, um uh, i would be willing to drop the word morality and to just use a kind of realist normativity instead uh and um i think a realist normativity uh does in fact um, exist uh, cross culturally I, I mean every culture has the word good and bad and i think um you know, I think they do have these principles of the fact that my unnecessary suffering is bad and uh, the unnecessary suffering of innocence is bad. And uh, maybe maybe those are just normative considerations. I, I kind of suspect mm, I kind of suspect they might be moral considerations, even if the current evidence doesn't really seem to bear this out. I kind of suspect there might be a moral domain at the end of the day. But even if there wasn't this moral domain, I would be willing to stick with a realist normativity that just says, okay, so we have orts, we have instrumental orts, and some of these orts are, some of the orts we use instrumentally, and some of them are just innate principles like my suffering, uh, my unnecessary suffering is bad. Yeah, so I, I, I'm just not convinced that, like, for you, you raise several concerns, like that they these exist inside of us. So some normative concern with with suffering is supposed to be innate, and then. I think the suggestion is that acting inconsistently, is it that acting inconsistency, inconsistently with maximizing utility generates some type of dissonance in people? Is that the claim? Um, well, the claim is, mm, yeah, in the sense, in the sense, I think, uh, in a sense, I think that is the claim uh, that when you, uh, you know they are they are inside of you and uh, mm, when you know when you let innocent people suffer because uh, of your own interests there's a part of you that knows in my opinion that what you're doing perhaps isn't the most moral thing there's a part of you that perhaps knows that the most moral thing is to sacrifice uh, your child to save you know 10 other children uh, maybe you can't do it but uh, uh, and, and I certainly think that other people, uh, and I think this is the evolutionary uh, part of it. I think certainly other people can uh, can very quickly recognize if you're being, let's say, selfish, in a sense that you're putting your suffering and your happiness above other people's suffering and happiness. And um, yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, may, yeah, I, I am a big, I am a bit vague about this cognitive dissonance point. Maybe. Maybe it's not that. Um, maybe, they, maybe, perhaps those are not the correct words of what I'm trying to express. Um, yeah. I don't know. Well, so I have a few concerns here. One is that I find it really implausible that people, on some level, know, so to speak, that actions that are not utility maximizing are wrong. Um, I think people can 
um, be enculturated into moralizing a variety of attitudes and concerns that would promote behaviors that even they themselves would not regard as utility maximizing and that they would be perfectly okay with. I think all through history, um, and especially there's there's two cases I want to apply this to, is attitudes about in-groups and out-groups and attitudes about non-human animals. So if people were like from from the perspective of what we would expect natural selection to do to shape human psychology, I don't see any particular reason why we should hypothesize that it would make us like concerned in an impartial way with everyone's well-being equally, including outgroup members that are potentially competitors for, for resources or non-human animals. I mean, they are a food resource. So, for, you know, so all over the world, uh, you know, we find that people eat animals in very large quantities. People seem to do everything they can to maybe uh, rationalize that in particular populations because they are sensitive to harm. Uh, but I, I very much doubt historically that people hunting animals 10,000 years ago suffered any particular degree of dissonance. Uh, I think to the extent that people in modern populations experience dissonance, this is largely a product of enculturation and education and the particular social circumstances they're in. So there's that concern. The other concern is that I don't think historically different populations have felt any dissonance when operating with hostility and aggression towards outgroup members. If anything, they might've even uh, moralized the harm towards or competitiveness towards outgroup members, at least under particular circumstances, like when that group is, is threatening them or something like that. Now, I don't think human populations historically have been absolutely bloodthirsty and ruthless and monstrous, but they, I don't, I, I find I'm very skeptical that there would be good evidence that everyone everywhere, when they get into conflicts with outgroup members, suffer uh, dissonance in, in causing them harm. I think that to the extent that people do suffer dissonance and they don't want to cause harm to other people, I, I think that's good because I don't want anybody to harm anybody, ideally. Uh, but I think that that's, that's a, a modern culturally acquired sentiment that I have. I don't think that's a feature of some sort of shared human psychology. Yeah, I I kind of think you've convinced me with uh, these two points. I think actually the stuff of cognitive dissonance is a, perhaps a bit of rubbish. Um, so I would try to amend what I'm trying to say in the sense that uh, while you were talking, I was thinking that in fact, even in the, even when we talk about inference, um, even when we talk about inference, people might be absolutely convinced they're making the correct inference, even when they're not. But there is an objective fact of uh, an objective fact of a matter uh, of which is the correct inference, and uh, how we go about making these inferences. Or in the case of deductive logic, there is a correct fact of a matter in which, uh, if an argument is sound and valid, and uh, so people, you know, are prone to all kinds of mistakes in the logical domain, and sometimes they don't realize they're making them. And uh, I don't know. Probably there's, I mean, maybe there's some cognitive, maybe there's some cognitive dissonance there. So there's some kind of unconscious cognitive dissonance. I don't know. This is this is a, a claim that's a bit, uh, you know, a bit dreamy by me. So I would just amend it to say that. Um, you know, not everybody manages to recognize uh, the true moral facts. And, uh, you know, you need time, you need you need to reflect, you need to be in a calm environment. If you were in a cave 2000 years ago, yeah, you'd probably act to try to maximize the happiness of your in-group and of yourself. But, you know, as soon as the circumstances arise where you can, where you actually, you actually reflect and you can you kind of think that, oh, even people of other nations could be part of my in-group. They're similar to me. They're not foreign monsters. Uh, they're not, you know, another kind of species. You kind of, uh, these moral principles kind of come out more. In the same way, I think the logical and inferential principles, uh, you know, historically, I think, have tend to have you know tend to uh, come out more in the late stages of history because people become more the IQ of people uh, is increasing through time so people become a bit more logical they make better inferences they're more in touch with their morality yeah I don't, yeah I don't know so yeah you, you you convinced me with your last two points so I would just amend uh, in a slightly more 
I don't know. Uh, yeah, well, I, I didn't mean to pick on that particular point because I, I understand that this is not something where you're claiming to have like a completed human yeah. psychology. We're not even close to no, that. No, no, but I think, but I think you were right. No, I, I actually, no, I really, I, I thank you because... No, well, that was great for me. I think that uh, you made some really good points just there. So I don't know. This cognitive dissonance, this cognitive dissonance stuff is a bit out there, in my opinion. So yeah. Well, no, so, what, thank you. What you brought up is you, you talked about people like if they reflect on it enough, they might come to recognize the moral facts. And I'm still I'm still puzzled by how the naturalist epistemology is supposed to operate because I, I'm not. I, I'm not seeing what the difference is between like moral naturalism and some type of linguistic account of how some population, and it could be all populations, use certain kinds of words and perhaps engage in certain types of judgment. So like, for instance, when a person judges that murder is wrong, on some level, they may be tracking, even if they're not consciously aware of it, that the reason why they think it's wrong, they have this intuition, they don't have complete introspective access to the underlying um, cognitive system that's delivering this intuition, but they have the intuition that it's wrong. And it, it, we could observe all these judgments about things being wrong or bad. And we don't need to put it in moral terms. Maybe there's these populations that don't have distinctively moral terminology, but we could still detect these sort of this like nomological cluster of judgments, like this pattern of judgments that humans in different societies engage in. We could look all over the world and we find pretty much anywhere we look, People are typically not going to be okay with someone just killing another person, especially in their own in-group, for no reason or for fun or for a stupid reason. They're not going to be okay with gratuitous lying. They're probably not going to be okay with someone like, you know, beating up their own parents or totally neglecting everybody else and being super duper selfish. There's going to be these shared things. People in pretty much every society are going to despise. They'll kick you out. They'll punish you. They're going to hate that thing. And there's going to be this, this whole suite of attitudes and judgments uh, around that. And they'll use some type of language to characterize this. So we can establish that there's some type of sh unity in what people care about. And then there's this question of like, if we're going to, to, to identify these patterns in what people are doing, we can propose that there's this certain sort of, of underlying unity and that this there, there's these certain sorts of things that people care about, that people are responsive to. And there you go. That's what I'm proposing as as the moral facts. I guess what I would want to, to uh, like, there's a few things that I would want to emphasize with this is one is that we would actually need to do the work to show that there's something like that, that there is the shared uh, unity in the sorts of things that people, you could say, attribute normative concern to. But um the other thing is I'm still wondering if moral realism or normative realism is supposed to be, it, it, if it's trying to capture or characterize something in addition to facts about the descriptive, like, like descriptive tendencies for particular populations to dislike certain sorts of things. Uh, for comparison, if we looked around the world, we could find uh, facts there's are going to, there's going to be shared there's going to be patterns in the facts of human food preferences. If you gave French fries to people five thousand years ago, I bet they'd love them. It's salty. It's 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 got it's a greasy. People like that stuff. They like fried. They like that crunchiness. So if you gave people chocolate that had never had chocolate before, they might they might they might blow their mind that this is the most delicious thing I've ever eaten. Assuming they don't have an allergy and they have immediately have problems, but you're going to have shared food preferences all around the world. If there's a reason why, and you could even look at these um, similarities. So like a common argument for moral realism is moral convergence. People have observed that over the span of the centuries that societies have tended to converge on similar moral attitudes. Okay, well, they've also tended to converge on similar food preferences. There are is There's French fries all over the world. There's Coca-Cola all over the world. There's certain kinds of candy all over the world. Not everywhere in the world initially had cane sugar or really, really sweet things or chocolate, and yet that's all over the world. Um, certain vegetables are all over, peppers all over the world. I'm giving too many examples. Anyway, uh, so the point, I'm, it's just because there's so many examples of the way in which food preferences, although they remain distinct and divergent, both at the individual and the population level, in many respects, they have converged and become more similar in ways that they weren't initially. Now, um, we could try to explain that, and we could try to explain just the general proclivities humans have had even before uh, modern technology and modern trade and all that. Um, first, 
let's deal with the convergence. What I would say is that the reason why people have converged on food preferences is that people share uh, an inclination to like some foods more than others, probably for evolutionary reasons, probably for shared cultural reasons. There's a bunch of causal factors going on and why people have the food preferences they have. But food preferences are not random. They're not arbitrary. And they're not completely determined by how you're educated. I don't think that you could just, you know, teach children that, you know, rusty nails are delicious, but, you know, uh, or but like French fries are disgusting. Chocolate chip cookies are gross, but, you know, big piles of dirt are the tastiest thing in the world. I don't think you're going to be able to readily convince anyone that that's true. Uh, so, th you know, to a certain extent, there are there's boundaries on the kinds of food preferences people are likely to have. Anyway, so uh, this sh this convergence in food preferences, I think, is mostly due to greater access. They're, we're able to transport food more quickly and more efficiently than in the past. And people are able to sample and try and learn about foods that they wouldn't previously have had access to. So I think that changes in, in culture, trade, and technology uh, are, are driving that convergence. So we could, uh, we could shift this over now to food preferences. Why did people have all these food preferences that once conditions that allowed people to eat the same foods arose? Once people on one side of the planet and the other side of the planet could both eat French fries, they both do in fact eat French fries. Um, we could also ask, you know, um, okay, well, why did they have those preferences in the first place? I'm not tempted to propose um, naturalist gastronomic realism. I'm not tempted to propose that this is because people in different parts of the world are responsive to or recognizing the stance independent gastronomic properties of French fries. And like, I recognize that pr French fries have the intrinsic property of deliciousness or whatever. And so do other people. I would just point to the fact that people have similar preferences and when given the opportunity to eat similar things. Um, and I think that you could take both of those features, both that empirical explanation for convergence and the empirical explanation for the initial proclivity to have those food preferences and move that over to morality. And you could say, okay, well, societies have converged on similar moral standards and they, we have these similar moral inclinations to begin with. Why? Or you could say normative inclinations. We could throw out my yeah. concerns with moral language. And then I would say, okay, well, People have similar preferences. Um, all else being equal, I prefer to do things that I, I enjoy, and I prefer not having my goals and, and desires thwarted. And under harsh circumstances in the past, with a lack of, of trade, a lack of wealth, a lack of resources, if I'm living out in the wilderness, um, I'm going to be very concerned that untrustworthy people that I encounter might try to kill me. Uh, and so I might have a rather harsh, you know, Mad Max moral sentiment under those circumstances. But as, as technology has improved and resource availability has improved, and as societies have interacted and communicated with them, uh, one another, as people have become part of a more global community, well, uh, you know, what might have been useful in a particular context, which would be aggression and hostility towards strangers, why? Not because you're a terrible person, but because if you don't, if you don't, if you're not prepared to defend yourself, um, you know, someone else is going to get you before you get them. You need to be wary. You know, it's like a Mad Max. It's like a zombie apocalypse type situation. Um, you have you, you, the the norms that are adaptive to those circumstances will differ from the norms that are adaptive in, you know, a modern wealthy nation. And so what we might see both to explain convergence and this tendency for people to have similar attitudes is that people's preferences uh, under similar so social circumstances tend to express themselves similarly. And in that case, I'm not seeing a need to posit moral facts in addition. And so basically what I'm saying here is that there's a couple a couple reasons why I think that moral naturalism, we wouldn't even want to propose that. One is that uh, there's a sort of abductive case, I think, to be made uh, that like, okay, so we have all these observations of people engaging in judgments and linguistic practices and normative behavior and all this sort of stuff. The best overall explanation, I don't see a need to posit distinctively moral facts or a stance of independent normative facts of any particular kind to account for any of our observations. If we need those facts, I would be curious as to why we need them, because I think we can account for all of our observations about human normative behavior and human moral discourse without appealing to stance independent facts. Um, and then that relates to the second concern, which is parsimony. Um, so I think that a, the simpler explanation just appeals to the fact that there are mundane psychological facts about human motivation, human values, and human preferences, and that we can account for human behavior and linguistic practices and judgment without appealing to any special category of additional facts. 
Okay. Okay. So uh, let let me first uh, kind of address the gastronomic realism um, stuff. Um, so I would certainly agree with you that we can see that people, you know, eat fries and certain cultures prefer different kind of foods. But if I but if I were to observe, you know, humanity as a as an alien population just looking in, I would certainly uh, see some um yeah, some principles that we kind of all follow, at least at a very, uh, not abstract, but at a superior level. I mean, we have some enzymes that digest certain kinds of foods. So uh, we have uh, um, a kind of unity in what we eat. And the space of possible things we could eat is extremely large with respect to what we do eat. So we could be eating anything. We could be eating rocks. Uh, and But we have a narrow, a narrow subspace of things that we eat. And um, and I think that uh, th there is also some research that I think, in certain in certain sense, does establish that there is a kind of uh, uh, of naturalism even in gastronomic preferences. So, for instance, I think there's been quite a few researchers who have studied uh, um, genes and connected it to wine preferences, and it seems to be quite well established actually that. You know, if you have certain genes, you're going to prefer certain wines. And what I think happens in the, in the kind of gastro in the gastronomic space is that there's a lot more of variability than in the moral space. So the, there's there's more genetic variability for a number of reasons. But uh, there is this kind of uh, realist naturalist uh, realist naturalism in the gastronomic case too, because uh, in a sense, because so if 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 I know you have the, these clusters of genes, I'm going to know you're not going to like wine, and uh, I think this is a nice example because it spells out what I mean with, also with my um, moral naturalist claim. Uh, it's the fact that so. Um, I know you have these genes and these genes are intertwined with your preferences and with your goals. So if you have these genes, it's going to be a fact that you're not going to prefer that wine. So you can, you can taste that wine and you can pretend to like it, but you're not going to like it. So it's, uh, it's simply not the case that you're going to want to drink that wine. As it is the case that once you recognize the moral facts, you're simply not going to want to act not in accordance with them. Uh, if, if you can help it, uh, if you're not in a stressful situation. You, you, so, um, so I'm tempted to see uh, a way in which uh, we can, in fact, uh, kind of compare the gastronomic enterprise with the moral enterprise. Um, okay. Uh, so then you had another point. So what was your other point you had after this gastronomic realism? Uh, so it has to do with, I guess you could say the, like uh, the, that naturalist accounts strike me as explanatorily superfluous. I don't, there are no observations about what the world is like that it seems to me that our best scientific models uh, require positing the existence of stance independent moral facts in order to explain. Okay, so I don't know. So when I look at the history of humanity, of how human populations think they ought to behave, or when they, you know, decide what rules a society is going to behave, I think it it is kind of valuable to say uh, maybe there is these there are these unifying principles, and uh, that they kind of emerge in different ways in different cultures, uh, and. Um, I don't know. I think there's a tendency in the literature that I've uh, that I've seen, especially moral foundation literature, to try to want to interpolate every data point. So to trying to find a function, a moral, uh, to trying to find uh, you know a moral framework that goes through every every culture exactly. But I, I don't think that's the appropriate model for morality or for gastronomic realism. I see you know. Uh, a model that's more stochastic that uh, can, uh, you know, uh, account for a certain degree of variability between populations uh, and between environments. Um, yeah, so uh, 
I don't, I don't know why, why, you, why don't you find it appealing to have a model of, of, of morality of how humans, uh, um, you know, tend to think about what, what is good and what is bad. Okay, not not morality. Let's say normativity. Let's say normativity because we moved off from morality before. So I so I'm not denying that we could have a model of how people think about normativity. Um, but I mean, one, like we'd actually need to do the empirical research to do that well. But two, at what point in that model do we need to posit that there are stance independent normative facts in order to account for people's judgments? So like, let's just suppose, for instance, uh, that when people went around making moral judgments. Uh, that they they imagine that there are stance independent moral facts, and so when a person said murder is wrong, that person actually was committed to some type of realist account. Uh, and what that person meant to say is they meant to say there are stance independent moral facts, and uh, that I when I say murder is wrong, what I mean is that this action would be inconsistent with those facts. Let's just suppose everyone spoke this way. Okay, uh, I'd still want to know why I should think that there are such facts. So like, why think that there are? Well, like, I don't need those facts to account for this person's behavior. I could just appeal to some type of error theory. And if there's any particular observations that we have that error theory couldn't account for, I'd want to know what they were. And I don't think that realists would be able to, to give a good account of what they were. So there's nothing about people's normative judgments or their meta-ethical judgments, if, they, if pe ordinary people like non-philosophers even make the meta-ethical judgments with any degree of frequency, at what point would I need to say that there are stance independent moral facts in order to account for anything? Uh, because when a person goes around saying murder is wrong, I could account for their attitudes, their preferences, their judgments, their beliefs about what's true and false, um, uh, their, their, so, their, like, their emotional states, their co cognitive states. At what point, uh, what can I not explain if, as an anti-realist? Uh, there's uh, just as far as I can tell. Uh, okay, but so so when when I say that uh, when when let's say let's say the research, as it seems, points out that certain clusters of genes are associated with the fact that you like wine or not, uh, wouldn't you say that's a gastronomic uh, uh, fact? Like, wouldn't you say of that's course it's a gastronomic fact? But but um, but the gastronomic anti-realist doesn't deny that there are gastronomic facts. They deny that there are first order gastronomic propositional claims that are true in a stance independent way. That's what they would deny. So what they would deny is that, for instance, chocolate is delicious, independent of how it tastes to anybody or independent of any standards of evaluation. That's what mm. they would deny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, OK, so yeah, so I get it. I get it. Yeah, of course it's gastronomic so facts. Yeah. So, and of course, yeah, so, there, like here would be a mundane moral fact. There's a moral fact that lots of people think murder is wrong. Like that's just, that's true. That's a moral fact. That doesn't mean I'm a realist. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, so perhaps I'm still uh, an anti-realist then, in the sense that, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it just seems to me that, for for example, when I say that the, these these clusters of genes are associated with the fact that you like wine. Uh, I would classify that in just distinctively, maybe I'm wrong, as actually uh, a gastronomic fact that is mind independent in the sense that it, it is independent by, of what you think about what you, if you like wine or not. Maybe you never taste wine in your life and you think, oh, I'm going to love this wine, but it's independent of what you think that if you have these genes, you're going to like it or not. So uh, in that sense, it, it strikes me as a mind independent fact. But perhaps I'm just um, muddling notation now. Yeah, so that's mind thought. independent in a sense that is not a threat to anti-realism. So the, an anti-realist can also agree it is a mind independent fact that murder tends to reduce well-being. That actually is true. Uh, but then there would be this question of why we should consider that to be a moral fact. And this is why I tend to raise what I call the triviality objection to naturalism. In principle, and, and you know, you do get naturalists that do this. There are naturalists that offer what they would say are revisionary accounts or um, yeah. they're engaged in conceptual engineering. And they would just say, look, I'm just stipulating that what I mean by a moral fact just is a fact that reduces well-being. Well, in that sense, trivially, I'm a moral realist. But these arguments strike me as um, in, very similar to if you are if you're an atheist and you say I don't believe in God and someone goes well I define God as ultimate purpose do you have an ultimate purpose in life and you're like yeah and like, then you believe in God so you know there's a way of just doing this kind of a 
this kind of prestidigitation with words where you say, I'm going to use this word to refer to this thing. This thing exists. Therefore, the word that I'm using to refer to is true. And that to me is exactly the kind of thing I dislike about a lot of, of analytic philosophy is what I take to be word games. And uh, if someone is explicit about those revisionary accounts, it's good that they're being explicit about it. And they're not trying to pull a trick in the sense of actually tricking people. Uh, but I think that the net effect in those cases is, is, ends up being these sort of um, trivial accounts. So, uh, mm -hmm. but that's that's answering a somewhat different concern. In this case, it is a stance independent fact that that certain sorts of causal factors are related to the kinds of preferences and attitudes that people have. It's true, uh, for instance, if someone has a gene that predisposes them to find cilantro to be tasty, uh, to taste like soap, that on average, people that find it to taste that way are going to be more likely to dislike it than someone that doesn't have the gene. So there's those kind of factors. There's also factors like, for instance, if a person, um, when they're young and they eat something and they get very sick, they can acquire, a, a, if not a permanent, then a very difficult to overcome nausea if they try to eat that food. Uh, so there's a variety of causal factors that influence our taste preferences. And the fact that, the, like, if it's a fact that I once ate you know, a piece of chocolate cake and I got violently ill and now I don't like chocolate cake. It's a fact that I don't like it for that reason. And that's true, independent of my, my preferences or values. But that's not the sense in which an anti-realist is denying that there are stance independent, or you could say mind independent facts. What the anti-realist is denying is that there are facts about whether the food is good or bad that are made true by some considerations other than my goal, other than my preferences. And these cases, what you're describing are causal facts that are true in a stance independent way about what has caused me to have certain kinds of preferences. Uh, but the fact that I dislike or like the particular food in question is still in, in a certain sense only true or false insofar as I actually like it or dislike it. And so in that respect, the gastronomic features of my gastronomic judgments are still in a certain sense beholden to and dependent on my stances. So all the genes in the world that are supposed to predispose me to find chocolate to be disgusting, for instance, if, I don't know, it's a distant future and we add cybernetic apparatuses to me that change the, my experience of eating the food, or I get some brain alteration or something, and now when I taste it, it's deeply enjoyable, Those genes, it's, now it tastes good to me. So too bad for the genes. Um, yeah, and so yeah. in that case, it's, uh, it's, in those cases, it's always my preferences that's doing the work there. When I'm saying that the chocolate cake is tasty, I'm telling you that it tastes good according to my goals, preferences, desires, that sort of thing, like from my stance. And I think yeah. that, that the same could be said about uh, moral considerations. I don't even know what it would mean for something to be morally good or bad in a way that isn't relativized to standards or preferences. Uh, it, it, to me, it would strike me as profoundly strange for someone to tell me that actions are morally wrong uh, if it had nothing to do with anybody's, if it wasn't reducible to considerations uh, from any particular point of view. Uh, and that's yeah. because I see that language as evaluative. It's like saying, you know, I, I, I often make this comparison to say that something is morally good or bad, but not in a way reducible to a, a, like a point of view or a standard or a stance is kind of like saying something is, is tasty independent of how it tastes. It just, I don't even know what that would mean. Uh, now, someone can take that type of evaluative claim and say, well, by this evaluative claim, I just mean a descriptive claim. I just mean... Um, that this action reduces well-being and that's true, independent of how anybody's evaluation of it is, okay. But the moment you do that, you lose you lose all the normativity and evaluativity out of it. You're just basically converting normative terminology into descriptive terminology. And you're just jettisoning all the stuff that made those statements distinctive in the first place. Yeah, okay. So, um, so I see... Uh... I don't. Uh, I see a lot of value in uh, in a reforming definition. Uh, um, in a reforming definition. So, um, yeah. So I agree with you that it, it's weird for me too when you say there's a moral fact that is is independent of your preferences, goals, and desires. So I don't think that something like that exists. In fact, when I when I've given my account of what I think the moral facts are, they are deeply in the, intertwined with your goals, preferences, and even the desires. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think that, I don't think uh, I'm, um, you know, I don't think I'm a classical uh, realist in that sense. Uh, yeah, I think I'm offering a reforming definition, in fact. And, uh, uh, 
you know, the reason why I think there is some value in talking about, I think this is the appeal of naturalist of naturalism for a lot of naturalists is that there, um, there seems to be some value in retaining uh, uh, the weightiness of um, of whatever facts you decide your your moral naturalism is gonna is gonna is gonna lie upon. If they are intrinsic, if they are intrinsic to you, they're motivating, and everybody has them. It's it's kind of real. It's kind of weird. It, it, it's kind of weird for me to say, okay, the moral facts don't exist. Or um, let's say the normative facts, the normative facts uh, don't exist. Uh, I think a good analogy is perhaps uh, uh, God, in this, in the sense that I'm a God naturalist. I wouldn't say I'm a God anti-realist. I think the best way to explain, uh, I've, I'm an atheist, and so uh, I wouldn't say God doesn't exist. I, I would rather say I wouldn't say the definition of God is uh, like. Uh, that God doesn't exist or there's no definition or it doesn't exist. I would say God uh, was a natural phenomena that occurred in populations and that is still occurring uh, in human populations because uh, they needed to explain a natural phenomena. They needed, uh, um, you know, for some psychological reasons, they needed to uh, invent this, uh, this entity and, uh, uh so I would give a naturalist account of God, and I think it's more, I don't know, explanatory. It just, it, it seems like, mm, so the, I read somewhere that the job of, of philosophy, one of the jobs of philosophy is kind of explain words. It, it, it's uh, to make the words, mm, you know, carry more information or be more precise in a sense. And it seems to me that naturalism like intuitively, it does a better job at saying, "Okay, yeah, perhaps it's trivial uh, in, um, as you say, but it's trivial in a good way, in the sense that it's trivial that it's true." So, yeah, just yeah, I just I just inclined to say, "Okay, these moral facts are actually natural facts." There's some kind of reforming definition that has to go on, to uh, uh, because the the current definition of morality is. Uh, in my opinion, probably nonsensical in some ways, or has to be adjusted, and uh, we can just go on with uh, with naturalism. So, if that's the case, then I it's no longer clear to me what the disagreement would be between my conception of anti-realism and your conception of realism, because there's there's two separate questions we could ask here. There's a question of what, how do we want to talk about what we think the world is like. And what do we think the world is like? And if we both agree on what the what kinds of stuff is out there, like what our observations are, we agree on what predictions we would make, even if we would characterize them differently. Um, what it ends up looking like is that we want to speak slightly different languages. You know, so it's like we both agree, like we could both be looking at an elephant, and I want to call it an elephant, or I, let's say you want to call it an elephant. I would just so I'll make myself the silly one here. I want to call it a, a <laughs> slubbity bubbity, right? You know, I want to call it something make, else. Okay. Yeah, I make it whatever silly name I want, right? So we then ask, okay, well, what things do we think there are in the world? When it, and this is like the world where there's just an elephant. Well, we could describe the elephant. We could say it's gray. We could say it has big ears. We could say it has like a prehensile nose. It has four legs. Uh, it's facing to the left currently. Oh, look, it just turned to the right. So like uh, from our points of view, let's say we're looking at it from the same angle. Um, and so we could agree on all of our observations. And then let's say we study the elephant's behavior. And then we could both agree on the model of its psychology. And then we can make predictions about it. And it's like everything is the same. Our model of the elephant is identical, but I want to call it one thing and you want to call it another. Um, and then we could argue about who's kind of like elephant elephantese, like elephant discourse is more useful. Okay, more useful for what? Relative to what standard? If if we're going to have a discussion about which discourse, whether the nor the the realist or the anti-realist discourse, like should be favored, we're asking what strikes me as a practical or a pragmatic question about what would be more useful or not. And then there's the question of like what normative standard are we using to evaluate that? Uh, and in that case, for me, that would reduce to my goals and interests. And so I would be perfectly happy to adopt realist sounding discourse and to go around saying that there are moral facts if I thought that that were 
more useful in a certain sense. Uh, but for me, the like truth and, and use are in a certain sense going to collapse into and converge on one another. And part of what I'm, I'm rejecting and rejecting that moral realism is true is also rejecting that speaking and thinking as though it were true is useful. Now, I am sensitive to empirical considerations about whether it would be more useful to, to speak in realist terms. I don't think that it would be. Uh, so that, but I, I get one thing I don't want to lose sight of here is that there's a difference in a disagreement about what what kinds of things are in the world, what uh, what populates our ontology, and a disagreement over how we want to characterize that ontology. And yeah, yeah, part of what I I'm think- part, yeah, part of what I'm concerned with, just to finish this thought, is that it sounds like you're willing to pivot to, or maybe this is a reflection of what your position already was, that you're suggesting that we're not even disagreeing on the observations and predictions. We're just disagreeing on the best way to talk about them. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, ontologically, we don't disagree. Perhaps this was um, a problem. Uh, Perhaps I I made a mistake when I was explaining my position. Uh, My position is laid out uh, in a document where I argue for a reforming definition of morality because, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so... Um, I, I'm not 100 percent sure that we uh, are in agreement ontologically, but um, I think so. I think so in the sense that there's no other, uh, you know, fat, moral facts floating around anywhere, uh, at, at least in that sense. Uh, um, but uh, so yeah, but I, I want to ask you a question. So would you say that you're um, a normative naturalist? Would you call yourself a normative naturalist? No, I wouldn't. So I'm a normative anti-realist. So I reject that there are any stance-independent normative facts of any kind, both within and outside of the moral domain. Okay. So, so I don't. I deny that there are stance-independent epistemic facts. I deny uh, stance-independent prudential facts. Just, if it's normative, I don't think that there's stance-independent normative facts. But don't you think there would be some use to, since since all populations use the word good or and bad, and I think they have some uh, some words for ought or should. Uh, wouldn't it since the normative naturalist account is trivial? I'm, I'm guessing it's kind of. Uh, wouldn't there be some use in retaining? Um, I think like yeah, wouldn't there be some use in just retaining the language of normativity? Do you think we should just do away with it? Well, I'm not advocating getting rid of normative language. I'm advocating an anti-realist conception of normative language in which we reject the notion that there are stance independent normative facts. Uh, there's a whole, so basically I think a lot of the, that language that when I say we should drop this discourse, the presumption a lot of philosophers might have is that I'm, I'm suggesting changes to ordinary language. I'm not suggesting any changes to ordinary language. I'm suggesting that particular types of philosophical disputes be dropped. Um, So I am a quietist about these issues, and I tend to think that critics like Wittgenstein and ordinary language philosophers got much of their their criticism of analytic philosophy correct. Um, So very roughly, uh, the problem here is that I think that philosophers, contemporary analytic philosophers, on my view, have a mistaken conception of how language and concepts work. And they rely on what I think are extremely faulty methods for coming to their conclusions. And a big part of that is on is what I take to be the conceptual analysis of toy sentences. So what I think that a lot of philosophers do, analytic philosophers, is they will take what they take to be exemplars or examples of ordinary language. They will take some sentence like murder is wrong and then attempt to analyze the meaning of that sentence outside of its context of usage. However, I endorse uh, a view of language that's more close to what Wittgenstein might endorse and what FCS Schiller, a a pragmatist philosopher that's been largely forgotten, would say about language. So I see language as use, and I don't think that words have meanings outside a context of usage. So the slogan I tend to say is that uh, words don't mean things, people mean things. So I see words as tools for for expressing the communicative intent of the speaker. And the words have literally no meaning uh, in any sense. But if we're going to talk about words having meaning, I'd say that the words have meaning in a context of usage. I would prefer to say that that the words are used to express meaning and that meaning is better understood as the 
communicative intent of the speaker or the, who, or the writer or whoever's commu- using the language. So the language is a tool for expressing the attitudes mm. uh, of, of some person. So the problem I have with the way that mm. philosophers analyze, and we could just take moral language as an example, is take a sentence like murder is wrong. Well, I think actual moral claims are moral claims that are made by actual people in actual contexts. But philosophers have historically not analyzed actual moral claims. If they were doing so, they would be doing uh, anthropological work. They'd be like sitting around observing people in the real world making moral claims. They'd be doing psychological work. They'd be doing some type of, you know, very empirical approach to linguistics. Maybe they would be doing data scraping of like internet searches or things posted on social media, and they would analyze language in the actual contexts in which it's used. They don't do that, or at least very rarely do they do that. So some people have. And there are experimental philosophers and people that do interdisciplinary work. But for the most part, they'll take some sentence like murder is wrong and say, that's a moral sentence. I don't consider that to be a moral sentence. I take that to be a possible sentence. That's a sentence someone could use to express a, a moral attitude. But the, when we just say, consider the sentence murder is wrong, no one's using it, and it's not its not appearing in any context, and so it doesn't have any meaning any more than random symbols would, would be a, a, a you know written language. There's just random symbols. So that sentence has a typical meaning when a person would use it, but what philosophers do is they take it out of its context of usage, and then they try to analyze its meaning outside that context of usage by appealing to their hmm. own judgments about that, and that's why but, but- I say – Sorry? You would, consi- you, wouldn't, you would consider it a normative statement, though. It's, uh, so in a certain sense, it's not actually a statement. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a toy. Well, it depends what you mean. Like, I, we don't have the vocabulary for this. I would say that there are, like, actual statements and then, like, hypothetical or possible statements. And I would, Or I prefer a phrase like toy statement. That's a toy statement. It's a possible statement that speakers of particular linguistic communities could use. And there are going to be stance independent or objective facts about what like a typical uh, native English speaker in 2023 would mean in most contexts in which they said murder is wrong. And we're assuming they're not being sarcastic. Oh, murder is wrong. You know, uh, where there's going to be features of the context of usage that would flesh out the pragmatic implicatures of what they're saying. So we're going to set aside elliptical uses or someone saying, according to Joe, murder is wrong. That's not. That's not me asserting murder's wrong. That's me quoting someone else. So we're setting aside those kinds of cases where I go, murder's wrong. You know, I say that. Um, that's, a, that's a moral claim. So murder is wrong. There is, a, there is a fact of the matter about what a typical person would mean in a particular context when using that word. But there isn't a fact of the matter about what that sentence means, murder is wrong, independent of some specifiable context. It just literally means it doesn't have a meaning because there's no communicative intent once you extract it from the context. So- Part of my concern is that philosophers historically have analyzed these sorts of sentences and then come up with accounts of the meaning of these sentences, but I don't think the sentences mean anything. I think there are, there are facts about the communicative intent of speakers. So philosophers then come up with all these accounts of what people mean uh, based on, on this analysis of toy sentences that I think are, are hollow and are empty of meaning. And in many cases, they're either they're either doing bad empirical research, they're doing they're doing armchair psychology where they're speculating about what other people do mean by these words, in which case I think that they're doing, it, it's like if I speculated about um, how people behave by thinking of experiences. Oh yeah, you know, I'd say about 70% of people lie to me. So it's pretty common for people to lie. Humans are generally dishonest. That is garbage, empirically speaking, compared to actually doing empirical research on how frequently people lie. So if philosophers are making empirical claims or doing empirical work when they're doing this, the, they're doing something that's very bad. It's not, a, it's not a good practice for the task. That's like, you know, holding your arm out in the air instead of using a thermometer in order to gauge what the temperature is. It's just not a rel- it's not a good way to do it. If they're not doing empirical work, then I don't know what the hell they're doing. I don't know what they're doing. What are they giving an account of? Uh, it's probably predicated on some conception of language that I don't accept. Uh, so, when, when I'm being asked questions about whether I would endorse some sort of account of normativity, I don't, I'm not entirely sure what I'm being asked. I kind of, in fact, in saying all this, I've kind of lost sight of what, what, the, <laughs> what was the question. I'm sorry. I don't know. My question was uh, about if you were, I think my question was uh, if you would consider yourself a, a normative uh, naturalist. Ah, okay. So um, what, I guess I would just have to ask, what is a normative naturalist? Oh, now I remember. Now I remember. Okay, so 
Um, all right. <laughs> Sorry. I, I go I, I go on spiels and I forget where I was going. Okay, so I had more things to say about this. Uh, all mm -hmm. right. So um, the reason why I, I, I want to reject a lot of this um, discourse that I'm talking about is that when philosophers start talking about this sort of thing, they might say, well, okay, I'm a normative naturalist. I believe that there are there are certain normative facts that are consistent with the natural world or whatever what the science is, or they would fit into our best scientific models of the world. There'd be some way they would characterize that. Anyway, uh, I think that they are going to want to import a bunch, a bunch of claims about the meaning or the presuppositions implicit in normative discourse or normative judgments that I would not be willing to accept. One example of this would be uh, when philosophers talk about normative reasons. So philosophers will say that, okay, well, uh, you know, people have reasons for performing some sorts of actions and they don't, they, uh, they have normative reasons for performing them. And when you ask them what they mean by that, they might say something, well, the reasons are things that count in favor. Um, and then if I ask them what they mean by that, I, I hit A, you can't just keep asking me forever to explain what I mean. Certain sorts of concepts are primitive. So I don't think that there are normative reasons and I don't think that their account of reasons, um, amounts to anything. I think it's literally meaningless. However, I don't think that that impinges on ordinary language. So I'm not attributing any kind of error or conceptual confusion to everyday uses of normative language, because I don't think that the stuff that philosophers are imagining are features of ordinary language. So the kinds of things I'm rejecting and saying that we should throw out are the what I take to be the mistaken concepts and misuses of language that are emblematic of analytic philosophy, but I don't think that that impinges back on ordinary discourse. So um, if, if the question is whether we could offer a scientifically respectable account of norms, normative discourse and normative judgment, absolutely. And I think we should get, we should be doing that right now. Uh, you know, we should be doing moral psych psychological research. The problem is that I think uh, there's a disconnect between the empirically and like scientifically respectable approach to doing that and what I take philosophers to be doing mm -hmm. when they talk about norms. I think they're imagining a bunch of conceptually and explanatorily superfluous baggage that's just just a bunch of mangled terminology. That okay, we can okay. Cross all of it out, we lose basically nothing. Okay, so if I get you correctly, if uh, let's say we do the empirical research and it does come out that uh, cross culturally, uh, we have uh, we we care about our we care about our own suffering. We care about the suffering of innocent people, mm, the necessary suffering. We we don't know. We uh, we seem to once we understand that other people are are able to suffer or, or are sentient being is able to suffer, we care about their suffering too. So even if we were to find out that let's say there were these principles that. By virtue of our biology, we we share as as humans. It still wouldn't be um, a naturalist account of morality, uh, according to according to you. Well, I I certainly think we could have natural accounts of morality or of normativity. I'm specifically denying something very particular, which is that there are stance independent facts about what's morally right or wrong or good or bad. And you could say more generally, normatively right or wrong good or bad. I, I think that the non-naturalist accounts are unintelligible. I don't I don't think that the concepts that they're trying to describe are meaningful. And I think that naturalist accounts are trivial in a certain sort of sense. They're failing to deliver that sort of practical cloud or oomph or whatever that non-naturalist accounts have. Uh, they're, mm -hmm. If they're going to argue that there's that there are moral facts, you know, there are different ways a naturalist might end up construing their account if they're going to just say that certain types of moral claims as a matter of empirical fact are analytically equivalent to certain sorts of natural facts, one, I don't think they're going to be successful in making that, that sort of attempt. And two, that does strike me as genuinely not particularly interesting uh, be, uh, in a certain sense, because it's, a, it's going to end up just being an empirical theory about how some population uses some sorts of words. Uh, if we're going for some sort of natural kind thing, like if we're going to say that there's some non-obvious underlying patterns in normative thought and normative judgment that a good scientific model uh, would, like the best scientific model would include, um, I'm open to that possibility. Uh, and in that sense, there might be some 
interesting type of account of normativity uh, of like human norms that would be interesting and non-obvious. Uh, I think it would be misleading and unhelpful to call that an account of um, like to say to say I'm a moral naturalist and that there are substantive stance independent moral facts or and again a lot of this applies to just normativity in general and part of the reason for that is very similar to my concerns with a lot of other philosophical theories a large part of it ends up reducing to the historical linguistic baggage of the field i'm not super thrilled with compatibilist accounts of free will because i still think that they carry with them the residual conflation between compatibilist and non-compatibilist conceptions of free will that carry over this notion that people could have genuine and substantive dessert-based responsibility. Um, and I don't think that they can, and I don't think a, a good compatibilist account should maintain that they do. And my, I, I would have a similar concern about naturalist accounts of morality is that if a naturalist is going to go around saying, well, it's a moral fact that we should care about well-being, or sorry, it's a moral fact. Uh, how should I word this? Uh, facts about well, well-being, sorry, f- moral facts are facts about what, maximizes well-being. Um, okay. Um, are, if they say, well, therefore, can they then say, therefore, you should maximize well-being or it's good to maximize well-being? Um, well, what do they mean when it's good to maximize well-being? Uh, it, that seems very mm-hmm. weird. It's just, it, it sounds like they're saying mm-hmm. it maximizes well-being to maximize well-being or <laughs> according to the linguistic use, like what we mean by what most people mean when they use the word good um, it, it's consistent with that usage to maximize well-being or something like that. Uh, like you end mm-hmm. up getting you end up just getting some sort of proposal about, or some account of how people are talking or how people are thinking. Um, why call that realism at that point? What are you getting out of that to call it realism? Mm-hmm. I'm not sure what the point is. And, and why, why align yourself terminologically with non-naturalists when they're proposing something very strange? To me, it's very similar to if there was a group of people that are like, look, I don't believe that there is an, a, a temporal being that's outside, you know, being outside of space and time that's omnipotent and all good and all knowing and all powerful that created the universe. I don't believe in one of those, but I do think that life has purpose and meaning. And so I'm going to call purpose and meaning God, or let's say love to pick something even more trivial. I think love exists and I want to call that God. And so I believe in God. Mm. I'm not an atheist because I think love exists. And I see moral mm. naturalist accounts, not quite as, as silly as that, because that's like obviously silly. And I don't think naturalism is obviously silly in that way. But I see it as, as it, well, it's not silly. I see it as not helpful uh, for mm. largely the same kinds of reasons. It's just that the, mm. the, the gap between that and love compared to like an um, omnipotent being outside of space and time is bigger. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, so thank you, Lance. Uh, that was very interesting. I'm going to have to think about what you just said. Um, because it, it was quite dense at times in the sense, not that it was dense, in the sense that it was incomprehensible, but there was a lot of concepts that needed need to be thought about for a while. Um, let's see, but I, I, found that, I found that point interesting. Uh, I don't know if I have any reply to what you just said, because I, um, I would really have to think about the details, and I'm not sure I ever thought about this. Uh, this linguistic uh, stuff uh, deeply. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I wouldn't want to say any nonsense right now. Yeah, keep in mind, a lot of that is is me sort of uh, internalizing a sort of set of objections to views that may have little or nothing to do with your views. So that's not even an objection to anything that you've said. And in many respects, I think that to the, nat- the naturalistically inclined of myself, we're kind of... Um, I, I would say in certain respects, methodologically inclined uh, towards towards a similar approach to a lot of these issues. So, you know, in that respect, I, I think we're both on the same page that there's very serious problems with non-naturalist realism. So I think we probably agree on that. Yeah. Would that not be the case? Yeah. I mean, it seems like that's been a running yeah, yeah. theme here. So, yeah, 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 yeah I'm not seeing yeah. lots of points of like really like serious, like, Arr! but you know, that tends to really happen when, when I argue with realists, uh, non-naturalist realists, and I rarely talk to naturalists as much. So one thing I really want to thank you for is just reminding me that I do not, I have not done enough reading on 
Gray's uh, model and some of these other models in moral psychology that I really need to dig in and, and have a look at what they have to say, because a lot of that is probably really interesting stuff. Yeah, but I don't think it's uh, a conclusive evidence at all of uh, what of my account of morality. It's just, you know, in my view, connected in a way. Um, no, I mean, yeah, thank, thank you for, for saying so much. No, I would thank you. I, I, would, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, it was great. I enjoy your work. As I already said in the introduction, so I was really happy. I'm happy that I gave you an account that wasn't as crazy as the non-naturalists uh, tend to give you. Um, so yeah, uh, this was very nice. <laughs>